So, get that going full screen. Spacecraft propulsion. Um, that's me. Welcome to the Jack C. Davis Observatory. Let me see if I can get this to actually go full screen. There we go. And tonight I'm going to talk about spacecraft propulsion. This is a relatively short talk, at least I hope so. I tried, I tried to design it to be short. We'll see how, how fast I can make this happen. Um, but really talking about how we get stuff to space and how we push it around once it's in space. Um, I've stuck in this talk mainly to primary propulsion system, the primary drive. Uh, I'll, I'll mention a little bit uh, maneuvering thrusters. Most commonly, maneuvering thrusters are just compressed gas. You get a tank of nitrogen gas that you carry up there and you shoot it out of a little, little jet and you can rotate the spacecraft or push it a tiny bit to the left or a tiny bit to the right. What I'm really going to talk about is how do you make it go forward. Um, the rocket engine uh, gets kind of mystified. It's really a, a jet engine, most rocket engines. They're, they're taking a, bu a, a bunch of gas, accelerating it, compressing it, and shooting it through a little uh, nozzle. These nozzles are usually uh, a particular shape. The particular shape for the rocket nozzle is this called the De Laval nozzle. I suppose after some guy named De Laval, but I. I didn't find a lot of history there. Uh, can I get some clarification when you say jet engine? Doesn't a jet engine require air, but a rocket engine does not? Rocket engines have gases in them, and so an air is a subset of a gas, right? Right. The difference is how do you how do you accelerate and compress the the gas? Do you bring it in the front and then squish it down? That's what a typical jet engine does. Rocket engines produce it in a combustion chamber, and then compress it down right. and shoot it out. Um, but but they're, they're, they're still a jet. You're injecting a jet of gas. And, uh, and they really are jet engines in that sense. Uh, but most people call them rocket engines because they don't pull air in the front. Because you go to space and you run out of air to pull in the front. Yeah. Um, this is a, an R-68 rocket engine that's being tested. Uh, let's see, the, St the Stennis Space Center. Um, this particular uh, exhaust, you can see this exhaust, you can kind of see through the exhaust plume, at least most of it, it's kind of almost transparent. Most of this exhaust is uh, water vapor from this engine. It's really, 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 really hot, but it's just water vapor. Um, and that's produced from the propellants. We'll talk about that in a minute. In a typical rocket engine, I, I've kind of I've drawn a real simple, you know, I, I found this real simple picture. You've got some kind of combustion chamber where you, you usually some sort of chemical reaction, but not necessarily. You're heating stuff up uh, and making hot gases. And then you shoot it out the back. About half of a typical rocket engine's thrust is from the unbalanced pressure. You get some, you get high pressure inside this combustion chamber as you heat stuff up. Um, the rest is letting the is getting the gas to expand through this nozzle. Uh, for those of you that know the term, we, you you want it to you want to get an adiabatic expansion. You want it to expand without losing any heat, which relatively is the way to do that is to do it very quickly and get it to pass through here very quickly. Um, and then you go back to uh, first semester physics and remember Newton's third law. It says for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Right? If I push gas out the back, I get pushed by the gas forward. 
That's really how rocket engines go. You know, I, the way I always say, this is Newton's third law, says if, if I push on you, then you're going to push back on me. That's, that's, how it, that's how it always works. The action reaction sounds fancier, but it's really, you know, I push on the floor, the floor pushes on me, etc. So you push the gas out, and the gas actually pushes back on the rocket forward. Um, incidentally, as, as a side note, this is a, a really good description of how airplanes fly. Wings push air down, air pushes wings up. Right? That's the, which is a better description than some other things. If you look in a lot of physics textbooks, they use Bernoulli's laws and stuff. But the shape of the airplane wing has to be like, curved. But then how do they fly upside down? Well, when they're flying upside down, they still push air down, and the air still pushes them up. Much easier description. Question? Uh, I was curious. Um, if you put one rocket, and you keep adding more and more rockets, is there a limit to how fast you can go? Oh, yeah, there's, there, there's <laughs> always, ultimately, there's the limit of speed of light. It would take an almost infinite amount of energy to take something like and get it up going, get it going the speed of light. An infinite no amount of energy to get it going the speed of light compared to the surface of the Earth, right? Um, so there, there's always that limit, but it kind of depends on what you're trying to shoot through. There are limits, there are more practical limits in the atmosphere. If you try to go too fast in the atmosphere, you've got uh, air resistance to work against. Um, most rocket launches, why most rocket launches go in two stages. Have you ever noticed? The pro rockets, you know. They try and go first stage as straight up as you can to get through as much atmosphere as you can, as fast as you can. And then tip over a little bit and insert into orbit with the second stage. That's really the, it's, it's not just, uh, it's not just, hey, we want to get rid of some of that stuff before we fire our second stage. It's really a, a practical consideration of let's get out of the atmosphere and then we'll do something else. Um, this, uh, this expansion nozzle, the De La Val nozzle, is really uh, one of the critical components to, to rockets. And, and getting it shaped just right for uh, a particular combustion chamber takes some calculation, but it's gotten pretty good at it, it turns out. Um, you want a pretty high expansion ratio you get these, but you'll notice that, that in the picture here it shows this plume coming out and, and kind of leaving the ends almost exactly parallel to the, to the end of the nozzle. You really want to try for that. If you get overexpanded or underexpanded, it, it affects the amount of thrust uh, in, a, in a bad way. You can see in the actual rocket test, there's pretty close, especially right here at the edge. If you look at the end of, of the nozzle, the plume is almost exactly parallel to the end of that nozzle by design. But it's that, uh, it's that design that, that gives the, the, that's why you see this shape <coughs> at the bottom of every rocket engine. Really, the engine is up here in this expansion nozzle at the bottom of, of almost everything. So, this is about as bad as it gets, right here. Uh, I, I, I got this slide from our buddies at NASA here. And they're talking about this, this any propulsion device. This is sort of basic, uh, as basic as you can make rocket science, right? Literally, this, this is rocket science right here. So there's a thrust equation, um, the M dot here, this is a f physicist shorthand. Robert, you want to clue him in? DMDT. Yeah, this, this dot means a derivative with respect to time. Yeah. Go calculus. Right? It means how does the mass change with time? And as physicists, that's how we like to think about rockets. You're expelling mass. The whole mass of the rocket is changing with time. And since there's a change in mass at a particular exhaust velocity, you get a force. So this, how fast you push stuff out of the rocket is really critical. Um, that exhaust velocity is, 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 is important. This, these here are pressures. Pressure in the engine, pressure outside, E and O. We're real imaginative with subscripts and engine outside. And then the area of 
that the cross-sectional area of that nozzle that you can exhaust stuff out of adds some extra force, right? Pre forces are, pressures are force per unit area, so if I spread out a pressure difference over an area, I get a force. So we get total rocket thrust from how quick do I expel mass and how fast does it leave the end of the rocket, plus what's the difference in pressure and what area is the, am I pushing stuff out of, right? The, the real important one is this exhaust velocity. And the way to make this bigger historically has been burn stuff at a hotter temperature in the combustion chamber. And that ties in with some thermodynamics. Uh, hot temperature means molecules shaking around at higher average kinetic energies. So if they have a higher average kinetic energy just shaking around randomly, once you start to direct them outwards, they have a higher uh, exhaust velocity. Um, I'll skip the rest of the stuff. There's some cool math in here. But uh, you get down to this, this uh, bottom equation here, and this is what most rocket scientists use to define the, the quality of a rocket. I mean, the, 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 the thing that they most often talk about is this guy. It's called the specific impulse. I for impulse, SP for specific. Specific impulse is sort of the accepted measure of, of a rocket engine performance. It's how much thrust per unit of propellant is how it comes out. So here, F is this thrust that we were talking about up here. There's our M dot changing thing. And G0 here is the gravitational acceleration at the surface you're launching from. But specific impulse is sort of a how much oomph do I get per how much stuff I shoot out the back. Um, as far as fuels go, uh, liquid hydrogen is one of the is the currently preferred fuel for rocket engines because it helps to get a very high specific impulse. Liquefied hydrogen because gaseous hydrogen takes up too much space, right? But there are other propellants. Everybody's heard about solid rockets, right? Well, the first people to do this, at least on record that we found good records of, were Chinese. This is actually a, a uh, let's see, this is a Song Dynasty Chinese rocket, solid rocket propellant. Um, and you'll hear people say, oh, well, it's, it's black powder. It's not exactly black powder. It's a similar composition, but anybody that's uh, played around with black powder, be honest now, um, you know what happens with black powder. It explodes, right? So if I just pack this thing full of black powder and apply it to this thing, it's just boom. It's a bomb. It's not a rocket. The key difference between rocket propellant and explosives is that rocket propellant burns quickly but doesn't burn explosively. You kind of want to hit the, there's a real delicate balance there with solid rocket propellants. And as a result, mistakes have been made. <laughs> Let's put it that way, right? Uh, we're, we're trying to strike this, this delicate balance with a solid rocket propellant. But this is really the first kind of rocket propellant there ever was, and was the predominant rocket propellant until early in the, the 1900s, early last century, when a few people started to think, well, what else could we use? Right? Uh, other than that, this was just my nice about. I didn't have time to put much information in here, but there's a, a local company uh, that a couple of my former students worked for called Digital Solid State Propulsion. One of the problems with a solid rocket is once you light that stuff off, boy, it just keeps burning until it's gone, right? Well, this company, Dig Digital Solid State Propulsion, have developed some materials which they can, they're, they, they can with some reliability, actually turn on and off electronically. They can electronically control the burn of a solid rocket fuel, which is a really big, big deal. 
if you can turn the stuff up, you can get a, a high density of material in here if you pack it in just right. right? Um, and it, it, but just having it shoot off and always burn out until it's done, you got to be real sure you want to fire your rocket. You can't turn it on enough. That's always been the problem with solid propellants. Once you turn it on, it goes. But they've made a lot of progress. Has not yet flown on any official missions. They've done a lot of testing right out here in the in the in the, the deserts in Nevada. Turning stuff on and off, and uh, and looking at exactly what's coming out in the plumes and how much thrust they can get and so on. Um, one of the key design parameters for a solid rocket that, that I found in, in doing some research. You see this, this uh, tube-like structure in the middle? This is usually uh, hollow in most solid rockets because you want some the gases to flow out through here. But the, the shape, the cross-sectional shape of this hollow portion turns out to be really important for controlling burn rates. Um, for instance, the cross-sectional shape in the the solid rocket boosters for the space shuttle is an 11 pointed star like shape. A star, kind of a star shape but with 11 points on it. All right, it's evenly spaced around the middle. And that seems to be the predominant shape that's used as some sort of star shape. It's not always 11 points, I've seen 8 and 6. But uh, getting that, uh, that burn rate to, to be predictable apparently involves some interesting geometry in that middle tube which I thought was really interesting. Uh, but even uh, a mod most model rocket engines are really pretty much something like this. A solid propellant, there's a little, little bit of a hollow area there. Um, model rocket engines, they, they, don't, they, they build the seal and the nozzle all into one little piece of clay down at the bottom, typically. Uh, but there's usually just a tiny bit of hollow area in the, in the bottom. Uh, I think that lack of a hollow tube all the way through in typical model rocket engines is one of the reasons you see them go crazy. Of course, the other is that you get uh, Boy Scouts gluing fins on sideways, and <laughs> that doesn't help you. This guy, anybody know who this is? Robert Goddard. Robert Goddard. This is uh, March 16, 1926. Uh, he's standing next to his invention, the first liquid-fueled rocket. Um, this was a gasoline and oxygen-fueled rocket. He thought that was that was the, the way to go. Uh, this is a this is a, a schematic of a rather infamous class of rockets. Anybody recognize it? V two. The V two, the German V two rocket. Lots of these got launched. Lots of them blew up on the pad. Lots of them blew up on the way. But <coughs> enough of them made it over to England to cause quite a bit of concern, right? And probably a few other places, I would, I would imagine. Um, but 1926, this guy kind of touched off liquid fuel rockets. And all of them essentially work the same. There's a combustion chamber, just like in the picture before, and that De La Val nozzle, little throat there. Some of them use pumps on this side to pump fuel and some sort of oxidizer. Uh, like I said, with, with NASA, oftentimes the preferred fuel is liquid hydrogen and the oxidizer is liquid oxygen. Since they're liquids, they're very, very cold. You've got to get cryogenic temperatures really cold to liquefy oxygen or hydrogen. Um, and as they expand, they cool off. But uh, some use pumps here. Some designs actually use pressurized chambers of some inert gas like nitrogen up top here and they'll push things through the tanks and then into the combustion chamber. Um, you can imagine that uh, this could get pretty complicated, especially if you're going to have more than one engine going at a time. This seems pretty common in a lot of rockets that you see get launched, right? They don't just have one of these guys sticking at the bottom. They're two or three or four, or in at least one case, ten. There's a lot of plumbing that goes on when you've got ten of these things attached to the bottom of your rocket casing. Yeah? 
Let me guess, the one with 10 was made by the Russians? Yes, it was. Um, I think one of those, one of the three they produced made it off the pad before it blew up. <laughs> Not very Not successful. Uh, yeah. um, and the typical problem that they had with those was actually plumbing. You get a leak in a liquid oxygen line and you have a spark <coughs> anywhere near it, guess what's going to happen? Boom! It's going to blow up very spectacularly. Um, but the, these uh, liquid propellants offer a lot of advantages, particularly over the solid propellants. Like I said, maybe this local company is starting to overcome one of the major problems of you can't really turn off a solid propellant. Maybe we're changing that. Question if you lost the ability to cool those tanks, they would explode from pressure. Right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you didn't keep the stuff cold, then it, the, the liquid would become uh, a gas and what was that? Any, uh, any dry ice bombs? Anybody? Be honest now. <laughs> so we we've seen this stuff happen, right? Um, but the 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 cool thing that came from liquid fueled rockets having some sort of liquid fuel and oxide. It, incidentally, the the liquid fuel in the uh, in the B twos I think was a an alcohol water mixture. And they used liquid oxygen as, as an oxidizer. But uh, alcohol fueled rockets, interestingly enough. But the nice thing about this is these pumps, you could run those pumps at different, different speeds, right? You could kind of control how much stuff gets into that combustion chamber, which would help you control the combustion rate, right? You could vary the mixture of things that get in there, which helped you control the combustion. Or you could just turn it off all at once. You could, you know, get out the system and says, hey, that's too much, I'm just going to shut down. You can turn this thing on, and then you go, well, maybe I really want to light this back up. And actually, the most, the, the trickiest part of, of these liquid fueled rockets is actually that ignition initially. Getting a spark to go off just down here, not anywhere over here, <laughs> right? And at just the right time. Uh, in some of the research I, I did, I, I found uh, tolerances for these e exact timing of the ignition switch to throw a spark in there needs to be within hundreds or sometimes tens of milliseconds to make sure that they get that that they have the right mixture of stuff in the combustion chamber before they introduce that spark. And if you do it too soon or too late, it either doesn't start or it explodes. Yeah, but we all know how reliable computers can be, right? <laughs> um, the, it, it's, it, it's tricky, it's particularly if you're just going to do this once in one rocket engine, it's a lot simpler than doing it with three or four or ten. Um, computer controls have helped tremendously, and ign ignition is, is less of a problem, but it's been because a lot of rockets have been blown up on the pad and they figured out later, oh, well, we waited just 100 milliseconds too long to, to light that off. Have you tried to do different fuels? In there are all sorts of, of, of schemes for fuels. Um, Can we try and make it cheap oxidizers enough? are almost always liquid oxygen because <coughs> it's all oxygen. And it's liquefied, so it's real, it's dense and you can carry a lot of it. All sorts of different uh, fuel burning fuels get from gasoline to liquid hydrogen to alcohol and hydrogen. It's tons of stuff. Tons of stuff. Um, and people continue to experiment with exactly what kind of fuel. And some people actually experiment. I didn't do tons of research on this, but some people experiment with the oxidizers because uh, liquid oxygen as well, pretty explosive, right? <clears throat> you get something that you can maybe control a little bit better than just pure liquid oxygen. There are also hybrid liquid slash solid propellants where they inject an oxidizer into that hollow tube in the middle of the, the solid propellant. Um, they're far, they're less common. Uh, they're sometimes used in second stages, but they're almost never a primary stage for a first stage for a rocket. Uh, I'm not sure why. Apparently they're trickier to, to
to make it work right. But the, the primary advantage of the liquid rocket motor was the ability to um, start and stop the rocket motor. And particularly stop and restart if you had to. So it wasn't just a one time, let's try it, oh crap, that rocket didn't work and didn't go where we wanted to. So that's totally going off course, turn it off. And try and correct it and turn it back on. Um, this is one of the more interesting uh, types of propellant here. There are some very typical, even this is nuclear propulsion, really the point is still use that nuclear reaction to heat up some gas and spew it out the back through the De La Bell nozzle. Um, gas core reactors uh, would be the, the type of nuclear salt water rocket. Anybody heard of I, if you were here for my <coughs> nuclear uh, physics talk about fission, I talked about those thorium, fluoride salt thorium reactors. Um, these nuclear salts, you can get really, really hot, which that's great, right? Really hot means high average kinetic energy. When you spew it out the back, you get good exhaust velocity of a rocket. Um, no one's actually tried those. They're, they're very hypothetical. And because stuff gets so hot, you risk melting your De La Val nozzle. And, and that is obviously problematic, right? The gas core reactor, um, there have been a few experiments done. No one has put a nuclear reactor in an actual rocket that went to space for the purpose of being the primary engine. Uh, or at least not that's gone on record. Um, <laughs> But you can get the gases to a really high exhaust speed. Nuclear reaction can produce really high temperatures in these gases. Another type of nuclear propulsion I thought was interesting was called the fission fragment. You wait for this big nucleus to fission apart, and you take those fission products and get at least one, hopefully maybe both if you can redirect one, to go out the back. As the fission happens, you spew stuff out the back as the stuff decays. Um, Purely hypothetical at this point. No one's really Since tried it. It's random, it'd be kind of hard to control. With it. it's, yeah, it'd be pretty tough to control because fission is random and uh, probably wouldn't produce a lot of thrust. The you know a daughter nucleus of, of, of a uranium fission is not all that big. You need a whole lot of stuff coming out the back, even though it's going fast to produce much thrust. Um, I put a picture down here. Some people are thinking, if we can figure out this fusion stuff, again, mostly hypothetical, and say, we're getting closer for fusion for power. That was another talk, right? But if we can figure this out, then we can take that superheated plasma that's, that's where fusion's going on. That's really hot. And we can actually use a, a magnetic nozzle. We don't have to worry about how hot it is. We can, with magnetic fields, create that De Laval nozzle shape. And that is where it gets very hypothetical. Uh, keeping these magnetic field lines stable in the shape we want, we have not yet really achieved. Especially not for a rocket. But uh, we're getting much closer with fusion for power. Because of Germany. What's that? Is it because of the Germany fusion plant? Uh, well, yeah, there was the Stellarator in, in, in Germany that they... They, it doesn't sound like much, but they contained an 80 million Kelvin hydrogen plasma for a quarter of a second. A quarter of a second sounds like, well, big deal. But a quarter of a second at 80 million Kelvin, that's a tremendously large temperature. That's three times the temperature of the sun. Before. Yeah, that's much hotter than this. So you're, you're talking a, a tremendous achievement. Fusion, they didn't, set, they didn't get to the critical density for fusion. They're going to do a lot more experiments with plasmas before they try that. They want to make sure they're going to hold on to that plasma for sure before they start fusion on that. But this may be a, a future technology. The biggest question about this would be the magnetic field instabilities and then how do you get this into space? Who's going to, you know, you got to launch this, right? Nobody really wants uh, hydrogen fusion byproducts being shot out into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. 
the weirdest nuclear propulsion technology that I that I saw uh, was called nuclear pulse propulsion. There's a picture of it going on here. Artist conception, obviously. What you do is you take a standard off-the-shelf atomic bomb <laughs> and you drop it out the back and set it off and then you have this big kind of blast shield in the back so when the shock wave hits the back of your spacecraft it just pushes you along. I would think that riding the shock wave of a nuclear blast seems like a tremendously bad idea. <laughs> but there's a lot board. of power in that blast, right? I need a surfboard for that. Yeah, I think they should call it. I think they should call it nuclear surfing. But <laughs> they didn't listen to me. That that was by far. I doing research for this. I thought, who came up with this cuckoo idea? Right, the blast wave of a nuclear blast. That was a serious idea in the fifties. But it's, it yeah, a very serious idea, and 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 remains on NASA's list of maybe we should try that. But the. This, the, the real trouble with even trying this, where, where you can't, you're not going to do it in the atmosphere, right? And so you need to get a nuclear bomb into outer space. There are some political issues with that. When we say tell Russia and China, well, we, no, 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 we're just doing it for rocket research. Sure, you're doing it for rocket research, right? No one's going to believe we're putting nuclear bombs in space just for rocket research. And how fast could that even get you going? Um, well. Pretty fast. If you if you take three or four of these things, uh, some calculations say you could get going up to a quarter of the speed of light. Pretty respectable speed. This is a that's a that's a lot of power, right? A nuclear blast is a lot of energy. Pretty hard to reverse to slow down, though. Yeah, you got to have some serious maneuvering jets, turn around, and then do it in reverse. That's that's really that's really what you did. You flip this whole thing around, and then you know somebody's gonna see you coming when your <laughs> nuclear blasts to decelerate you go off, right? Not exactly a sneaky spacecraft, <laughs> but nuclear propulsion was was one of the more interesting things I ran across. Um, using light to propel rockets is. Sounds like science fiction, but of course this is done. There are a couple of classes of it. The first one I wanted to talk about was the photon rocket. Here's, an, here's sort of a, a, a schematic of an idea. Um, you take whatever fuel this is, nobody's real specific about this, fuel tank, some stuff, and you use it to make something glow really bright and emit electromagnetic radiation. And then you take a big shiny thing reflector, okay, and bounce photons off of it, and the radiation pressure will actually propel you forward. So you, this is really, uh, some light comes up here, bounces back this way. You want this to be a pretty specific shape, probably an ellipse. Yeah. Uh, this isn't really solar sails, no. It's a similar te technology, but you're not using the sun. You have your own illumination source. Right, oh, right here. I get it. This is your own illumination source. Like a mini that's sun. Uh, you know, hopefully it's as bright as the sun, right? Because then you can actually go somewhere. Um, <laughs> this radiation pressure is not large. We'll talk more about it with solar sails in a, in a second. One of the other things that I found, this is actually some serious NASA research, and there's a, a private company that's been founded based on this. This is called the Photonic Laser Thruster. Sounds awesome, right? Sounds like it's from... Uh, Star Trek as well. But the idea is you have a, a, a spacecraft, maybe even a, a conventional thruster, this is launch platform, this is kind of at home. And it ca it carries fuel and stuff, but you can go visit it and give it more fuel. And, get, and you got a high power, you, get a, you, you have a, a laser in here, some sort of gain medium to help your laser pick up some power uh, and, and focus it a little bit. But also, a nice, highly reflective <coughs> mirror. And the actual mission spacecraft is this guy over here. You just shoot that laser beam at him, high power laser in this case, and bounce photons back and forth against these things. So you've got to keep pushing this guy forward a little bit. You notice he's much bigger. And you've got your mission spacecraft, you just keep pushing along with light. Um, it's been tested on a very, very small scale and does work. 
NASA put a bunch of money into this. As I said, there's a private company that was spun off as a result. Um, the primary advantage to this that NASA sees and why they keep, why they have sustained interest in it, is that the mission spacecraft doesn't really have to carry much fuel, just stuff for maneuvering. Right? And then you can uh, use some gravitation to decelerate, right? All right, and you go to Mars maybe, like in the picture here. Eventually, people, uh, uh, the, the people at NASA and the people in this, in this new company, they, they say, what we want to do is have a bunch of these things throughout the solar system and set up a photonic railway system where you go hop on and you get pushed in the direction you want to go by a laser beam in your spacecraft. Um, that's pretty far into the future, but we, it's scaling it up remains the problem now. The, the, the physics is, is pretty solid, and the science is pretty solid, which I thought was an exciting take on, on it. And it has a lot more, has a lot more uh, detail to it than fuel tank and aluminum. Um, we'll get to solar sails in a minute. I want to talk about this guy. It's not really so much a, a change in the rocket engine technology as it is trying to take advantage of that jet engine aspect of a rocket. The Bussard ramjet. Anybody know what a ramjet is at all? Ish? Right? Yeah. You're trying to take extra air in the front with a ram. You have a scoop, basically, that scoops stuff up. The Bussard ramjet is an, this idea. You use uh, electromagnetic fields to scoop up the hydrogen gas in interstellar, in, in, in interstellar space, or even just around in the solar system. Um, enormous electromagnetic fields, kilometers, maybe even thousands of kilometers in diameter. So how do you generate that? Well, you've got to take something with you. Bussard, the guy that invented this, was not specific. He said, it sounds like a cool idea. You scoop stuff up, then you don't have to take as much fuel with you if you can harvest it while you're on the way, right? That's really the advantage of this thing. You, you can gather stuff while traveling. So you're traveling in this direction, and you're scooping up fuel, right? Then you kind of compress that fuel, and you keep compressing it and compressing it. And you, transfer it back here, you compress it even more, and you compress it to the point where fusion kicks off, and then you use your fusion exhaust to go. That was Bussard's original idea. Now, this is obviously very hypothetical. It relies on us being able to control fusion more than we can right now. Um, so, that's going to require a, a lot of time. And of course, this is not something that you, uh, you, you build on a small scale. You got to it's probably stuff we're going to have to build in outer space if we're going to do something like this. But getting a little bit more exotic here, right? Um, this is purely hypothetical. This is the, these are all artist conceptions. But you can see I got basically a big scoop, and then I can press stuff and shoot it up with that. It really is a jet engine. It's just the space jet engine. Doesn't it sound a little bit like a perpetual motion machine? Well, no, there's, there's, the problem yeah. with it be you, you have to expend so much energy to get those magnetic fields, it'll always be more than the hydrogen that you're collecting. That's the primary criticism. <coughs> What's the density of hydrogen you can really collect? Well, not much. You're going to have to be close to the sun for this to be practical, say most people. But he said, well, if I can make a big enough one, it doesn't have to have a, a, a large strength, it just has to be there. So, uh, there are advocates and, and, and not. I think this is pretty science. The, the science, yeah, the science would work, assuming we can engineer something like this, is a pretty big leap in, well, into fiction. Well, they're think. not burning the hydrogen, though. They're using fusion. Well, they're, what, what, they, they, what they think is you, you, com, you keep compressing it down until it gets dense enough and hot enough that fusion kicks off. Right. What do you use so, to do that? Well, you got to have a power source. That doesn't happen for free. Um, what they hope is that that forward motion is helping to compress stuff down. Well, that's going to take a lot of, you're going to have to be going pretty fast for that to happen. <coughs> um, 
There might be a way, Tom, if you're close to a star, a magnetic field. Uh, yeah. To move it through the magnetic field to produce the electrical energy. That yeah, and and that's what that's what uh, some of the when I research this a in a little bit more detail, some of the advocates say this isn't going to work if you're going to Pluto. But if you go and cruise by the sun real quick, you can scoop up a lot of stuff and get and 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 use that fuel to give yourself the big boost and then go to the outer <coughs> solar system. Seems like it, every time you go anywhere, you got to go drop by the sun and pick up fuel. Um, it, and it seems like an extreme detour for every trip. Well, they don't get back. Yeah. Yeah. And then you got to come back. Yeah. So maybe if we're going to go to the next over star, we should think about random. Now this stuff uh, is not exactly fiction. There's a working one at the NASA Center. Electromagnetic thrusters, as a general class, you probably see them as ion drives, if you're looking at them <coughs> on Google. Ion thrusters are the primary type of electromagnetic thruster, but not the only type. They work something like as shown in this, uh, this diagram. You get an electric, it really, it could, be a, it could be an anode, but usually it's a cathode, shooting out, something shooting off electrons. Um, you have some <coughs> neutral propellant atoms, these little green guys in this picture. And when an electron hits one, you have you have a, a, a you know energetic enough electron it'll ionize it knock an electron another electron off and you're left with a positive ion. Then you use uh, a couple of grids back here that you introduce a high voltage electric potential between it accelerates the ions the ions spew out the back and you get some thrust because ions go out the back and then they neutralize these with with some ions most of the time. Um, they all rely generally ion thrusters on the Coulomb force, static electric force, or the Lorentz force with some use actually try to use magnetic fields to to uh, not accelerate the electron not accelerate ions in the first place but to but to kind of squish them down with a nozzle sort of an action. Um, these have been tested and used. Uh, this is a Hall effect thruster, right here. This guy right here is a is a a picture of the N star solar powered electrostatic ion propulsion engine. Deep Space One and Dawn Probe have one of these on, and. Being solar powered, they're they're uh, relatively efficient. You get about a 1,300 volt uh, difference between between these electrode plates. Um, the N star thruster produces a thrust of 20 to 92 milli newtons. Milli is 10 to the minus three. This is a tiny amount of thrust. But the velocity of those particles? you can leave it on for a long time. What's the velocity of the particles coming at the end there? Um, well, they're, uh, they're singly ionized xenon atoms, yeah. and you accelerate them through 1,300 volts. So uh, whatever 1,300 electron volts turns into a, turns a, a, a xenon atom into. Xenon's not all that heavy. It's an atom. Um, in terms of specific impulse, though, you can get upwards of 31,000 newton seconds per kilogram, which is pretty good. It's not liquid fuel rocket good, but it's pretty good. And it's pretty cheap to produce. You can, you can do this with a, with a solar panel array on your spacecraft and a small supply of, of propellant. Right. Um, a lot of people say, oh, it's ions, you, you, you still need a propellant, you've got to have something to ionize. And typically what's been used is xenon because it's easy to ionize and it's otherwise inert. So if it gets out, it doesn't blow anything up. Right. One of the primary advantages to the ion drive, 
the propellant doesn't need to be explosive. Have they had any idea what kind of uh, sustained velocity, I mean, over a burn of a month or something, how, long, how fast would it be going? Well, let's see, we can calculate. Uh, I mean, do they have enough energy to, there to burn it for a, a long yeah. period of time? To get yeah, and, and I think it, it, it varies as the spacecraft gets further from the sun and the solar panels get less illuminance, right? Less, yeah. less, less uh, energy per square meter onto them. Um, that's one of the troubles with the ion drive. Do you really want to send this to Pluto? Not if you're relying on solar panels for charging your yeah. charging your system, right? It will go if it's power, if it has power by fusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 If you're going to fusion power, you just do a regular rocket anyway. You can get fusion up there anyway. Um, these guys, their primary advantage is that, uh, is that you can carry non-volatile stuff as a propellant. That you just have to strip an electron off of. Tom, in your research, did you, did, was there anybody working on an experiment that, where they would take real sharp electrodes and put a potential on them and let them, you know, the eye, the build a high electric field density at the tip of the... Of the um, a like lot the, of the designs for these, but when I looked really close, you can actually, you could build a small one yourself that'll, you know, flutter a piece of paper. Make Magazine has a design for you. Yeah. Build your own ion engine. And, and it really, you hold a piece of paper in front of it and it kind of flutters like this. Mm -hmm. But it's really some nails and some little pieces of, of copper pipe about this big yeah. around and a high voltage power supply. Okay. You got a neon sign transformer, you can build your own. Um, but uh, this is the, that, high, yeah, that high electric field density at the end of the spike. Most of the, a lot of the designs, this electron gun is really a, a spike that they inject electrons onto electrically. And then uh, you can see this kind of glowing ring around here. There's really two of them. It's just harder to see. All the glow on there is, uh, is ions pouring off of there. Um, another interesting take on electromagnetic thrusters is called the electrothermal engine. You just use electricity <coughs> to heat up your propellant gas. You put a big coil inside a mixture of gases maybe not even an explosive one, and just heat it up real hot and eject it out the back like a regular rocket. Still technically an electromagnetic thruster, um, but not nearly as exciting as the ion drives like those, these guys. This is an interesting one down here. Um, it's one, one of several similar designs, generally referred to as the RF resonant cavity. They try and get usually microwaves to resonate in this cavity, but they make one end slightly larger than the other. And, and uh, there's, there's no propellant in here. That's the interesting thing. NASA, a Chinese lab, an Indian lab, and, and, and one other have actually, they, they've made versions of these things themselves, tested them, and they do indeed produce thrust. Tiny amounts, less than these guys, way less. Um, at least in the case of a couple of the labs, well below the noise threshold of their force, their thrust measuring machines. Uh, so this is kind of controversial stuff, but um, a few independent tests have measured some thrust with a propellantless rocket, which is of concern to physicists because we say, well, sounds like a perpetual motion machine. Where's the energy coming from? Um, and the 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 answer from the design the couple of different guys that have designed these things has been oh well it's a relativistic effect of, of the resonant microwaves near the ends of the resonant tube which seems kind of hand wavy to me um, <laughs> and that's all the information I could find I could find no specific information on how these things really work but it appears that they do produce thrust without propellant. NASA said, yeah, we measured one pretty much, and it seemed to produce thrust. We'd sure like to do it at our better lab. The, the, 
the, the spot where they measured this, um, they, didn't, they, they built a, a prototype and they put it in a vacuum chamber, but uh, it's not their best vacuum chamber ever, so there may have been some leftover stuff in there affecting the measurement. Um, and it's very small amounts of thrust. So people are worried about this stuff. They call them the EM drive, or the, there's a, a guy named Ken A that uh, put, attached his name to a Ken A drive. Uh, they're, they're pretty controversial at this point. Uh, a propellantless rocket seems to violate a lot of basic physics. Um, that said, it might be some complicated physics that's really making them work. Uh, Time will tell, I suppose. Uh, but the, at, at the surface, these, thi these things seem to violate momentum conservation. And so a lot of scientists say, well, yeah, it, it's, you, you're, it's coming from somewhere else. If you're getting the thrust, it's coming from somewhere else. It's not really this resonant effect. Um, we, we, don't think, we, haven't, we, we don't think Newton is that wrong, <laughs> in, in short. So I ran across a lot of, uh, of blog posts and other, and other stuff about these propellantless drives and, and a lot of sensational headlines. I mean, NASA finds magical rocket engine with no propellants. Well, no, no. NASA made some measurements and said, well, yeah, we measured a thrust, but uh, we're not sure we believe it. We should probably measure this again. Worth investigating, but certainly not revolutionary, not yet. Anyway. Tom, you know how magnetic field lines, when they cross, when, when, like on the sun, it creates, you know, bl blast effects on the surface? Yeah. The Some way it could, could cause that to happen spontaneously, yeah. you know? Yeah, and it, it, it's, I, like I said, the designer, the, the designers of these things, they haven't, they, they're not releasing any specifics because they want to protect their invention or whatever, which, you know, if you want people to believe you, you're going to have to get specific. Everybody's heard about these things, and the idea is pretty old. Check this picture out. Yeah. He was old enough to recognize both people. Carl Sagan, Carl Sagan and Johnny Carson. Right? Carl Sagan talking about solar sails. This is, you know, this is pushing, using incoming light to 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 uh, from the sun to sail on, or even just the stellar wind, right? Solar wind, all the stuff coming out from, from the sun. Um, this is a picture of an ESA solar sail, fully deployed. You can see for scale some people here. This thing's pretty big, right? It's got to be big in order to gather enough light. And these are relying on radiation pressure, small particles bouncing off of them to push them along. That's going to have to be awfully big. However, has been tested. This is a model that's uh, it, it, it's held, I think it's a JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency. This is the, a model of the Icarus Japanese solar cycle. Uh, 9th of July, 2010, they launched one into space. Not real big, but they launched one. Uh, collected radiation from the sun. It began acceleration from photons hitting it from the sun. Um, and it spent six months traveling to Venus. And it is now on its way towards the sun. They got to tack in, I guess. I, I'm not a sailor. <laughs> but uh, I found a great picture from XKCD, my favorite one. If you want to use sol uh, uh, photon pressure to levitate a squirrel, you need about 1.21 gigawatts <laughs> to do this on Earth. This is, you're talking. You know, on this little plate, this, these are not going to go, going to, going to accelerate quickly. The amounts of, the equivalent amounts of thrust. You're not really using a rocket engine here, but, but the amounts of acceleration you're going to get from a solar sail depend critically on how big you can make it. And you got to make it real big. Um, one of the more interesting variations I found on, on sailing in space. That's why I didn't just call it solar sails or photon sails. It's called the fission sail. You make a sail in a two-layer sheet. One side is a, an absorbing side that absorbs heavy nuclei. The other 
is some sort of nuclear fuel, if it's something that, that naturally fissions, hopefully at a relatively high rate. And when that fission goes off, on this side, you get a daughter nucleus that goes in and sticks and pushes, right? The other one, it shoots out the other way. Robert mentioned the problem with this. How do I make sure it goes that way and that way? Sometimes they go this way and this way, or like this. Um, you hope for you, you. You hope that that's why you have to have that absorbing shield so that some component helps push you forward. If you, could, it, if you could cause all the components to be parallel, you get a bounce effect and double your momentum. Yeah, and the uh, the 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 little bit more detail that I, that I looked into is you don't just make this a flat sail, right? You make a curve so that even if some even if something kind of goes straight up almost parallel to the surface that it was sitting on, it'll eventually hit part of the sail and help accelerate things a little bit. Not a bad idea, but then again, you got to take some nuclear material into space and nobody's going to be real keen on that, right? <laughs> but at least you can take non-bomb making material into space to make your fission sail work rather than a bunch of atomic bombs out on your spacecraft for, for nuclear blast surfing, like we talked about earlier. Um, probably the mo most exotic type of propulsion I found was yeah. this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Miguel Alcubier, I don't know how to say his name for sure, he's a Mexican physicist, and he came up with uh, this idea. Looks simple, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, he says that you take a volume of flat space and put it in a bubble of curved space. Quote from sure, because that's easier, right? Right, yeah. Um, and uh, this is his term. Let's see if I can get this right. The bubble he calls a hyper relativistic local dynamic space. <laughs> Basically, what he says happens, he says he's calculated based on general relativity. He says, the space out in front of this thing, the space time in front of it, um, is kind of contracted, and the space time behind it is expanded, and you get sort of a space time pressure differential, and this thing moves locally, right? Um, I'm not sure exactly how, he, how the people are planning to, to, to warp space-time with this. Uh, the details of that are, are shrouded in differential geometry, which I still struggle to, to make any sense of. And non-Euclidean differential geometry. But to have the warp space in the first place, don't you have to have an inertial mass to do that? Yeah. Not according to this guy. Okay. You, you can't say that. <laughs> He says that uh, the, the, first, the first calculations said, well, yeah, you could probably make this happen, but you need the power of about 10 suns. So, cool idea, not very practical. Um, further revisions on his idea said, no, 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 you only need, like, a couple of fusion bomb kind of power. We can do that. Again... Lots of amounts of power that we're not going to be able to generate. I think effectively the idea is that they're they're using energy and 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 turning it into okay. a space time warping mass. That's kind of what I got out of it. But again, I'm not a general relativity theorist, and so this a lot of this stuff went right over my head. Um, the basic idea is is try and locally warp space-time. I brought this one up before, that begs the question, well, what's space-time? I have yet to get a really good answer to that from anyone. It's the stuff that's out there. It's like, well, well what's the stuff? It's the background. Why is there a background? No one's given me a good answer to this. But this is a pretty <coughs> exotic idea, and NASA spends money on this. They, they, this warp drive is very is serious science, and they really, really want to figure it out. Um, but pretty exotic and, and, and way out there. Not something that's going to happen tomorrow, barring a huge revolution in physics. I don't think we understand, understand what, it is, what space time is 
well enough to manipulate it at all. Uh, or that you know, it really even definitely exists. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's an okay model for a lot of things, but I don't think we're going to be making spacecraft that use warp drive for quite a long time. Uh, lithium crystals around the Yeah, it's yeah, so, uh, <laughs> hard to find them. So, any questions? Concerns? I'm concerned about people using nuclear bombs to surf in space, but <laughs> not really concerned. Uh, be sure to, to, to come to Mike's. We're going to get two in a row from Mike, like you've had for me. Mike's going to do black holes on May 28th. And man, spacecraft. I found this picture and couldn't help myself. <laughs> but uh, Mike will be talking twice in a row, May 28th and June 11th. Be sure to, to come to that. And feel free to ask me about stuff. You didn't mention magnetically contained antimatter as your fuel source or your energy source. Uh, if we can't do fusion, we can't do that either. <laughs> so, can't you pass some antimatter down? Yeah. Um, Antimatter has been generated, but it's, it's really uh, in tiny, tiny amounts, and, and you need a particle accelerator to do it at this point. Did you hear about the way they want to send people? Instead of on trains, they're going to put them in little like, uh, boats, and they're going to shoot them at the speed of sound, like from Oh, the, 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 yeah, the, uh, the subway thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah they want to suck up the air and it it. Yeah, I'm trying to reduce the... The, the physics is pretty sound. The engineering is on its way. I, I don't see why there, it's a, sort of a matter of time. Uh, the question there is really, how safe can you make that? Yeah. Traveling at the speed of sound is probably not very safe at this point. Uh, but you're not going to fly. Yeah. They've got a hundred million dollars in money already. Yeah. They, and, and, they got, you know, they've got some money. I, I don't, I don't, I don't have any doubt that it can be done. I doubt that it can be done uh, to safety regulators' standards anytime soon. It's going to be a while before we got that. The, the, the really big trick is what happens when the system, when there's some failure in the system, while the train's going. What do you do about that? That's really the problem. It's not can we make it go that fast. I absolutely believe. It's what happens when uh, a weasel chews, a, chews out a power line, and which happened recently at the LHC, right? Mm -hmm. um, what happens when so, when some animal comes and chews on chews on something like the, chews on the outer casing of this thing, or to, you know, causes something to go to go wrong, and the car full of passengers is going past that spot that has some critical components not working. So the sort of fail safety you have. That's the that's the remaining problem for that. But it's not real. You're not going to put people in space with that stuff anyway. People die in train wrecks every day. Yeah. Is there credibility to uh, having something in space that we can pick up a person or you know, plane? Space like, elevators? Yeah. Let the thing um, spin and yeah. come back down. There's a video on YouTube of that did explain about that. Space elevators are, at this point, we don't have the materials to make them work well. Um, the, the physics behind it, sure, yeah, absolutely. The science behind it, absolutely. Uh, we can do space elevators, but uh, engineering wise, I don't think we quite have the materials. Maybe graphene is, is a good step in the right direction. Graphene and uh, coded things, probably. Tom, they did launch um, a space shuttle specifically with that experiment on it. With the, the sky, mm -hmm. they, they were, they were um, trailing long, long wires through the ionosphere or something like that. Uh -huh. An attempt to, to generate something or other. And apparently it proved too hard to be practical. Yeah, the, Part of the problem is the atmosphere is awfully turbulent and big and unpredictable. That's probably the largest challenge with the space elevator is at some elevation, some altitude, the wind's going to blow real hard, and at another altitude, it's going to blow real hard in the other direction, and that puts a shear force on your whole space elevator, 
and then it's got to be really, really strong to withstand that. But and somebody, it also has to be really, really light, or you can't make it that tall. Somebody thought enough of this to bother launching a, a space shuttle with yeah. some guys in it to mm -hmm. uh, test it, but it, it just didn't work correctly. Mm. You, when you're talking about the ion propulsion, uh, the uh, Dawn probe used that? According to NASA, it had that N-star ion drive on it, yeah. yeah. The Dawn probe that's a, like a series. Yeah. Yeah. Series to best. Series to yeah. best. So it's been used. Yeah, they're, they're being used, and they're getting better. But there's, these are things that, like, like Robert Munch, what you have to do to, to get the things going very fast is to fire them for a long time. You've got to leave them <coughs> but, for a long time. Yeah, the advantage is if... You know, like if you do want to go visit an asteroid that you know is not going to be around for 30 years, yeah, we can launch it now. You know, yeah, not in a big rush, anyways. Yeah, so they're 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 good for for probes, particularly smaller craft, but they're getting better and better. Um, I don't think you're going to see an ion drive launching stuff off the surface of the planet anytime soon. Yeah, or perhaps ever. <laughs> but uh, they're working on it. So about some planet hiding out in our solar system. Oh, the here, here, here's the here's the short story on Planet Nine or X or whatever they're calling it. Some computer simulations uh, run by a team, a couple of different teams now, indicate that some of the things we see moving from the Kuiper Belt region, like comets and things like that, would have tracks like we see if there's something big out there like a planet. It has not been directly observed. So it's, it's really based on some computer simulations say, hey, we can explain stuff we have seen a little bit more accurately than we do now if we include a big planet out in the outer solar system that's a thousand astronomical units away. Uh, there, no, there, no one's seen it. It directly at all, and the, and as big as it's supposed to be, we won't see it from Earth. And even Hubble is going to have a hard time seeing it because um, it's just that far away. Supposedly, it's going to come close to us and uh, cause us to kind of warp. Or something. Well, close is a relative term. Close is still, you know, they, they're saying that the close approach of this thing is still hundreds of astronomical units away. Pluto is forty astronomical. And it's then it's hard to see. Even even as big as it's supposed to be, we're not going to see it if it comes close. Not with the ground-based telescope. Maybe, maybe, maybe with one of the big guys, like in the Atacama Desert, or if the 30-meter telescope manages to get built in Mauna Kea, maybe one of those guys could see it from the ground. But it's pretty. It's a pretty wild one <coughs> to detect that thing, especially not visually. Maybe in the infrared. Other questions? Make sure to come for black holes in a couple of weeks. <clears throat>